The lectureship is named after the late Rudy Kamani, one of the founders of the ESDR in 1970. And that reminds me that our 50th meeting is next year, and it will take place in Amsterdam, where the ESDR began. This year is a great pleasure to introduce this, this year's Rudy Kamani lecture, and it's a good, my good friend, Professor Nick Reynolds. Nick is Professor of Dermatology in Newcastle in the UK, and is also Director of Newcastle's Molecular Pathology Node, which brings together researchers, clinicians, and industry together to bring molecular diagnostic tools for personalized medicine. So it's a bit like the, the ESTR format. Nick is a past president of the ESTR and has been a key part of the development of the ESTR, helping to bring it, is to where, to bring it to where it is now, which is much more than an organisation that runs just the annual meeting, but a society that sports, supports and develops our skin scientists and future leaders in skin science. Nick today will talk about his current research and interest in systems biology and computational modelling to understand pathogenesis and therapy in inflammatory skin disease. Thank you. Nick. Thank you very much, uh, David. It's a very kind introduction. And I'm indeed deeply honored to be invited to present this year's Rudy Kilmani Lecture. Whilst I was on the board, I had the opportunity and privilege to work with some fantastic friends and colleagues, both in Europe uh, and further afield through the ISID. And I very much enjoy being part of the ESGR community. And so I'm uh, extremely pleased to be invited to give this lecture today. Uh, Newcastle is famous for its seven bridges which span the Tyne River. And without stretching this analogy too far, as a physician scientist, I do believe that collaboration is crucial. And collaboration is crucial on a number of levels. It's crucial to bring scientists together with different dif disciplines, to bring individual centers together so we can collaborate, particularly for translational and clinical studies, and increasingly collaboration is international. So societies such as the ESDR play a key role in this bridging exercise. Here are a list of my disclosures. So Rudy Komani was brought up in the Dutch East Indies, now Indonesia, before studying medicine and dermatology in Holland, where he later became a professor and chair of the renowned department in Amsterdam. The image on the left shows him in uh, official university dr um, dress at a thesis defense th ceremony. But after work, he liked to relax and enjoy a glass of wine or cocktail with close colleagues and friends. And as we've heard, as a founder member, he was influ influential in the initial decision for recurrent annual meetings of the ESDR to be held in Amsterdam. But I do think that the subsequent judgment to move the ESDR meetings around Europe has been a very good one and has increased the vibrancy of the meeting. I'm also pleased that one of the original statutes, which said the board and uh, general members couldn't be more than age 50, has been removed. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here today along with many of my senior colleagues. <laughs> one of Rudy Kumani's recognized strengths was to be able to inspire and train young people. And as we've heard, the ESDR continues to pursue this goal in conjunction with its sister societies, such as the EADV. And I was very fortunate to work closely with Irvin Shackler, highlighted at the back, um, who was at the time a board member of the EADV. And we shared a common outlook which helped to set up this uh, research summer workshop um, that uh, supported the training of both young dermatologists and young scientists. Uh, the first meeting was held in Vienna in 2010, and I think you can still recognize Amy Fuchs, who's made important contributions to SORT, and also Idel Toul, who's now on the board. I should say that Idel was a faculty member at this meeting. Um, and I'm very pleased that uh, Erwin will be receiving his honorary membership of the ESDR tomorrow, so I look forward to congratulating him then. 
and the, and the course continues to flourish. So this year's meeting was held in Orsay near Paris, led by Lionel Leroux, and I've seen the feedback, which was really, truly exceptional. So I think these features of the ESDR are really important. So now onto some science. I became interested in systems biology about 10 years ago in thinking with others about how the uh, soetic plaque resolves over a period of weeks when it's treated with either biologic or UV phototherapy. And we know from many other studies that the gene expression patterns that are very abnormal in the plaque at baseline virtually return to normal over many weeks. But it's still unclear what the actual driving force is. How do the biologics that inter interface with the particular targets like TNF, how do they then lead to this change in morphology and gene expression? Those changes are not really understood. And in part, I think it's because of the complex biology, the complex interaction between the epidermis, the innate immune system, the acquired immune system. But it's also, I think, due to the fact that the data that's been generated is extremely complex. And at the present, we don't really have frameworks to integrate these data that include clinical, omic, uh, immunological data into a way that provides this detailed level of understanding. Um, there's been an explosion of interest in what we call big data and its application to uh, medicine. Um, so I'll briefly co cover this in the first part of the lecture and, and, and see some of the positive influences that are starting to occur. Secondly, I'll focus on some of the studies we've done looking at a systems biology approach to how, these, uh, how UV may remodel the epidermis. And then thirdly, we'll I'll illustrate some very recent transcriptomic data generated by the SORT consortium and how that is providing insight into how biologics may work and how we may be moving towards uh, personalized medicine or precision medicine. Um, and I think that is an ultimate goal in many fields, not least in inflammatory skin disease. So many of you will be familiar with the phrase or aphorism that the world's most valuable resource is no longer oil, but data. And this was highlighted on the cover of The Economist in 2017. And whilst there were some issues with that statement, and it's not quite as simple as it sounds, there's no doubt there's been a massive growth in uh, application of technologies such as artificial intelligence to healthcare. And this analysis predicts um, an 11-fold increase in investment in this area with an increase in 40% per annum between 2014 and 2021. And one of the leaders in the field, Eric Topal, um, has written this excellent book, which I'd recommend. And as his view is, as long as you're wary of the hype, these new analytical tools do offer great promise uh, to be able to facilitate particularly diagnostics and to therefore uh, free physicians up to spend more time with patients and make healthcare human again. To date, most progress has been made with image analysis and what Eric Topol calls pattern specialties. He is a cardiologist. And it's highlighted really by this landmark paper in 2017 in Nature on the application of AI to skin cancer diagnosis. And I'm very much looking forward to Andre Estevez's talk on Saturday on this topic. But it can all go wrong. And you may be aware of the fallout from Cambridge Analytica, uh, a political consulting firm that mined uh, Facebook data in a somewhat dubious fashion, and then this was used to uh, influence public opinion during democratic elections. And consequently, it's crucial that the regulatory frameworks are put in place and controls to make sure that the data that we give is consented and, and properly monitored. So with this background, if we step back and really think about uh, the potential utility of systems biology and specifically its application to dermatology. In essence, systems biology can be seen as an experimental approach that is designed to create a holistic working model of a biological system. And at its center is an in silico computational model which integrates different types of data um, and puts this together, and, and then this data can be applied to understanding at many levels that range from signaling within a cell to tissues such as skin 
and whole organisms, including patients and personalized medicine. And the key elements of such a model are the ability to be able to run simulations, um, identify knowledge gaps, predict outcomes, and the model itself can test different hypotheses and hone down the questions you really need to apply in a clinical uh, study or trial. And if this is done properly, it can essentially sa save years of time and fast track us to the key questions that we all want to test in the clinic. And to date, we've used really stochastic and deterministic models in studying psoriatic epidermis. But there is an increasing interest in artificial intelligence and how this may be applied to complex clinical anomic data. So stochastic models are well suited to biology because they cover random events. Um, and, um, and, and so that is an important part. Each time you run the model, you get a slightly different result. On the other hand, deterministic models are based on average reproducible results and often involve differential equations. The distinctive feature of artificial intelligence is that the model itself structures algorithms and layers the data uh, to create an artificial neural network that can learn from data and further inputs and make predictions that again can be tested. So in collaboration with colleagues from computer science who are listed at the bottom of the slide, we've used stochastic and deterministic models to uh, look at what's going on in normal and psoriatic epidermis. And we've specifically tested the hypothesis that apoptosis may be involved in this remodeling process, um, as, and we've focused on UV for the reasons I'll come to. And more recently, we've run simulations under different conditions that can now incorporate truly individualized patient irradiation regimes, and we're going to be moving towards personalization of therapy. One of the advantages of stochastic modeling is that it provides a spatial as well as quantitative output. And compartments exist within the model. Each particular cell there has its own code, and that tells the cell how to behave according to a set of preset instructions which you can vary. And through an iterative series of modeling, Sophie Weatherhead, in conjunction with computer science, showed that key changes were required to convert what looks like normal epidermis through to something that looks like psoriatic epidermis. And the key changes were really increasing the number of stem cells that cycle from 20 to 80%. And this was combined with uh, increase in TA cell division. And as well as showing morphological similarity, the quantitative outputs of turnover and transit time match closely those that have been derived experimentally over a number of years. So Rudy Komani was interested in phototherapy and photochemotherapy. And it's notable that one of the few Nobel Prizes awarded in the field of cutaneous medicine was to Niels Finsen in Denmark in recognition of his important work on the treatment of cutaneous disease, specifically uh, lupus vulgaris, uh, shown here. And following treatment, you can see uh, quite good resolution. So in 1903, this was groundbreaking. Um, and you can see that the irradiation device is quite interesting. So they used arc lamps, and these were focused through a series of lenses uh, to four patients treated simultaneously. And the brass tubing had to be cooled with water to prevent thermal burns. So these days, we take UV phototherapy for granted. But in Newcastle, we still treat more than 1,000 patients a year with UVB phototherapy. And you can see from the PARSI scores that the outputs and the outcomes are really very respectable. Um, and the other advantage of studying UV is that you can see from the trajectories, because the patients are attending regularly the hospital, we can capture very carefully and monitor their trajectory of response, which we'll come back to. Um, and I think you know, UV is interesting for another number of other reasons. Um, the action spectrum has been defined. Its effects are very local. So you can see in this experiment, 
Um, UV has been irradiated into the plaque and clears a very localized area. Uh, it doesn't have a spill-out effect or graduation effect. And thirdly, and perhaps surprisingly, psoriasis can cope with multiple sunburn doses of UV. So you can see here, this patient received M eight MEDs or 16 MEDs to produce this level of clearance. And in a seminal study by Parrish and Yannicke back in 1981, they used monochromatic irradiation repeatedly of plaques to be able to define this action spectrum. And what they found was that 290, although it was inducing redness, did not clear psoriasis at all, whereas wavelengths between 300 and 313 did, with 313 being the most effective, and that led really to the introduction of narrowband UVB or TLO1 lamps um, with output peaking at 311 that is used in all of our departments around Europe and worldwide. So in a study we published in the GID back in 2011, uh, Sophie Weatherhead performed this clinical study and used this paradigm to be able to compare um, biological outcome from effective wavelengths 311 to ineffective 290. And these patients were about to enter phototherapy, and as they did, they were irradiated locally on the back and then biopsied 24 hours later. And what we found was a striking increase in apoptotic cells within the psoriatic compartment with effective wavelengths, 311, but not with ineffective. And this was particularly striking given that psoriasis is known to be resistant to apoptosis. More recently, uh, Rachel Roberts and colleagues in the lab have performed transcriptomic studies of uh, similar biopsies taken at slightly earlier time points and then figured out the genes that have been differentially regulated and fed these into ingenuity. And because we don't think 290 is relevant to clearance of psoriasis, we exclude all these DEGs and focus on the DEGs in the blue and purple circles, the numbers reflecting the number of DEGs. And again, you can see that with uh, you know, a completely open, non-hypothesis-driven data analysis, uh, cell death and apoptosis is still clearly highlighted. You also note that the, the cells undergoing apoptosis uh, vary according to this prediction and are not only keratinocytes, but include lymphocytes. When, when we quantify the data, you can see on a log scale, there's a marked difference with 311 compared to 290, with virtually no patients 290 inducing apoptosis. And then we fed this data into our model to see if the level of apoptosis that was occurring was sufficient to induce the apoptosis. And I'm now going to show you a simulation of the model uh, as it's shown here. So you can see the models turning over because the cells are kind of flickering away. And you can see that there were a number of sliders. Very shortly, we're going to turn on a cytokine stimulus that will increase the rate of division of the stem cells and TA cells according to uh, what I reported earlier. You can see with that stimulus, the epidermis is increasing in thickness and becoming more papillomatous. And in the, and in the diagram, on the, on the left, uh, you can see here that the, the cell numbers of both the TA and differentiating cells have increased. It then reaches a steady state, and we can then turn off the cytokine stimulus. Very shortly, we're going to hit this model with uh, uh, apoptosis uh, by the UV, and as that happens, you'll see gaps appearing within the epidermal compartment and as that happens, the epidermis starts to remodel and shrink back to its normal state, um, uh, ready again, potentially, to receive another cytokine stimulus and develop into a plaque. The important thing about these states is that they are stable, because uh, in some situations, models are unstable, and in which case, you know this isn't going to be very useful. And as I mentioned, we can get quantitative outputs from this, so we can study the change in the numbers of cells over the irradiation course. And one of the questions that we asked was whether could we substitute cell growth arrest for apoptosis, and would that lead on to the similar changes that we've just seen? And the answer is it does uh, work. It does lead to remodeling of the epidermis, but there's a significant lag phase such that the, um, with the cell growth arrest, 
the remodeling doesn't occur until after the last irradiation, which clearly for the clinicians amongst us we know isn't what happens to our patients in clinic. So this doesn't seem to be very likely on its own as the key mechanism. So more recently, we've used deterministic models in which we use differential equations to look, introduce new, t new cell types, T cells, and to be able to model the different cytokines that are produced both by keratinocytes and T cells and include a positive feedback loop according to the most recent data derived from transcriptomic studies. And uh, in line with clinical observation, that uh, the first psoriasis visible appears four days after a streptococcal sore throat, you can see that a four-day cytokine stimulus is sufficient to kick the model into action, whereas two days, the model has a little blip, but then settles down. So that isn't sufficient to kick the model into the right state. And the beauty of the of this uh, uh, modeling is that it's much quicker to program and run the model so we can do many more studies than we could with the old model. And so we can include now individual patient doses. So these are real doses that were used by patients during the course and we can see how this effect uh, uh, on the epidermal compartment uh, as well as seeing how it affects the apoptosis rate. And so in this um, uh, slide, we've shown real patient data, PARSI scores in red triangles. We've fed that patient's data, including their UV radiation data, into our model. And you can see there's a very close approximation between our black model line and the clinical time course of resolution with the PARSI scores. Now, from the studies that we've done in the clinic, it's clear that not all patients clear perfectly during treatment. Some people may have a flare halfway through. I think we all recognize that. Um, and so this is a patient who's had a flare. The question is, why have they had a flare? Is it that the UV has stopped working or what? So we tested whether providing a secondary immune stimulus at this particular time would account for the pattern of the flare, and that did appear to be the case. And uh, very recently, we've generated data to be able to model potential changes to individual patient irradiation regimes based on this modeling. So you can see this patient's had a flare quite quickly into the treatment course um, with um, a flare here, and then gradually improves, but doesn't completely clear at the end of the course, and our model predicts they're likely to, to um, flare up shortly afterwards. So this is the usual course, three times a week of UVB phototherapy. If in close proximity to the flare, we increase the frequency to five times a week, we can settle down this patient um, in the model. And so we're now in a position to go and test this in the clinic. So to summarize this section of the talk, I hope I've illustrated the utility of agent-based and deterministic models of psoriasis epidermis and that these have allowed us to uh, simulate and make predictions about clinical outcomes as patients go through the UV phototherapy. We've definitely uh, identified some knowledge gaps, and we've started to uh, be able in a position where we can apply these in a personalized regime. Which leads nicely on to the final section of my talk, which further underscores the importance of collaboration in developing a uh, a stratified medicine approach to biologic therapy in psoriasis. So the SORT consortium uh, represent a multidisciplinary consortium led by Chris Griffiths, University of Manchester, that brings together a number of academic and clinical departments around the UK um, and is collaborative with 10 life science companies that include pharma as well as diagnostic companies and is funded by the MRC. Its principal aims are to investigate disease and drug endotype, to be able to derive scalable, clinically relevant biomarkers that will stratify response to biologic therapy. And we're also aiming to gain greater understanding about the pathogenesis and the mechanisms involved in this remodeling of the plaque that clearly occurs with biologic treatments. So this schematic um, highlights the um, patient flow and sampling times in the SORT discovery cohort. 
These were appropriately powered to ensure we had enough patients in each group. So we've got 41 patients in the adalimumab group and 41 in the ustekinumab group. So these patients are you know, in real life, they're starting treatment in the clinic, and before they start, we perform baseline sampling of involved and uninvolved skin, and we take further skin biopsies at week one and week 12. Blood samples are taken at all different time points, and uh, the blood analysis is done in parallel, but I'm not going to discuss that for the sake of time today. But in the end, we are aiming for full data integration. So this is a heat map, uh, which is a little bit complicated, so I'll take you through the slide. But essentially, what we've done is look at genes at individual time points, that's zero, week one, and week 12, and associated these with clinical response at week 12, which is measured as the change in PARSI score between week one and week 12 delta PARSI. So in other words, we're looking for genes at baseline, potentially, that would predict outcome 12 weeks later, which we can imagine would be very useful in the clinic. Um, and when we compare the two drugs, you can see that many of the pathways that have been pulled out by the upstream IPA analysis are very similar, but there are also some ones that show striking differences, and one of them is interferon. And if I zoom in on the interferon, what's notable here, if you can look on this part of the graph where the p-values are, the, the strongest p-value for association with response is the gene changes at baseline in the plaque. Uh, which may be a bit surprising. And also, that is only really there for the ostekinumab cohort, and it's not there for the adalimumab cohort. And this is reflected in the z-scores, which show dampening of this pathway as being predictive of response. So at week 12, all patients are showing dampening of interferon signaling, which is telling us, I think, that this is an important signaling pathway that helps to clear psoriasis. But it's clear that the ustekinumab cohort is a bit distinct in that they, if they've got dampenex signaling at, at, um, at baseline, that then suggests those particular group of patients are going to do well with one drug compared to another. And to further illustrate this, um, this is an ingenuity pathway which shows the different kinds of interferons that are downregulate and are associated with clinical response. So you can see that the, with the ustekinumab cohort, the level of downregulation, the green colors in all the different uh, uh, proteins here are pretty similar, okay? Whereas if you look at the adalimumab cohort, you can see there's no green at baseline at all, but the green appears and is markedly there at week 12, where it's very similar to the ustekinumab uh, cohort. Conversely, there are other pathways that show association with response to adalimumab, and one of those was the inflammasome pathway. And again, if we zoom in on that, you can see that the highest p-value is for adalimumab at baseline, and that this is dampened again, and, and this then uh, remains dampened, whereas the ustekinumab cohort is not dampened at baseline, but is dampened as you get to week 12. So bringing this all together, it's clear that there is a very complicated relationship between drug endotype and disease endotype. So we know that the drugs block specific molecules, and they seem to influence differentially, um, and even are primed to do so from baseline, the interferon and the inflammasome signaling. And then we're starting to consider what are the downstream pathways that mediate the plaque clearance that leads it to completely go over a period of weeks. And to do so, we don't think we're going to get the answer only from transcriptomics, but we're going to integrate genetic, um, other omic data, as well as drug-level data, because if you've got no drug in the system, it's unlikely you're going to clear, and also the clinical response characteristics, which we think are very important. So to conclude, um, I think we live in a data-driven era, which some have termed the third industrial revolution. And I strongly believe that a computational modeling approach combined with appropriately powered, carefully done clinical studies uh, will take us into a new era of personalized and precision medicine. But for this to succeed, as a community, we need to work together and develop and champion academic industrial partnerships and international collaborative networks, 
which I think the ESDR is all about. And I'd like to close with a quote from Charles Darwin, which I think is pertinent to this, which says, it is the long history of humankind that those who learn to collaborate and improvise most effectively have prevailed. And of course, in these collaborative studies, um, they represent an enormous amount of input from all the individuals that are listed here and many others who there isn't uh, A, room to fit on the slide, and B, I can find the named individuals to those directly contributing to the studies that I've presented today. So thank you for your attention. Great lecture. Uh, your, your certificate is in the post. Great. It's just, it's just been, the usual ESDR. It's there. been signed. <laughs> it's just been finalised. Uh, as usual with this lecture, Nick will not take questions from the podium, but I'm sure he's happy to take questions. Yeah, I think the poster, to, yeah, so sure. yeah, fine. Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you, you Nick.